Yeah, I did a lot of jobs. Uh, I was mowing lawns when I was younger, and that was push mower. And I worked for all the different farmers. I did, I, I uh, tromped hay, hauled bales of hay. I worked uh, in the beet field, the uh, topping beets, and potatoes. My uncle raised a lot of potatoes there in Smithfield, and so I, I think I was eight years old, and I went to work him during beet vacation, and he did me a little section, and as a, they'd come and dig them, I had to pick those up, and then they'd make a rounds, long road, come back, so I had to keep that picked up and put in the sack. So I, I think I like top and beats the best. I worked for him for a number of years. I got older, and we had a crew that really worked good. We could top a lot of beats in a day. We 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 just out topped other uh, groups in the same field. We we just top a lot faster to get more beats done. I did picked up or pick beans when I was younger. Uh, oh, and then another thing, during the uh, pea run in the spring, I, we, they had pea viners, one big one there in the Smithfield by the cannings, there at uh, South Main there, and out in the West Fields, me and this old, <laughs> he, he was a never been married and he was an alcoholic, but we worked together and you, they'd come in with the uh, hay racks full of uh, peas and they fed them into the viners. Then it would go through the viners, get the peas out of them, and then out on a conveyor belt and drop. And we stacked it. And you had to make sure you had good corners because that's what the farmers would come in in the winter and that brought the peas in. They was allowed to come and get the silage back to feed their cattle. And then well, we moved up and there were about, I don't know, four or five of us took that big one in. Smithfield, and that <laughs> they we'd store it early in the morning because it was uh, they sour. So we anyway on Saturday night we'd uh, go go to the dance and had to be back to work in Smithfield about one one thirty to start and then go the rest of the night. So I did a lot of jobs. Nord for Dad and well, Thursday. Mom, what was your first job? My first job was. My dad had a huge garden, and he planted beans. And this is how we made this is how we made money for our school clothes, is we had to pick so many rows of beans every other day. And and one year, and we looked in the catalogs and we knew exactly what we was going to order. So we had to make that much money to order our clothes for school. And I fell short. And I felt so bad because I wasn't going to be able to get this cute little skirt that I'd seen, and my dad got it for us. Now, Dad, you you started Utah Power and Light, which is now Rocky Mountain Power. Yeah, I first when I got out of high school, I went to Ogden. My dad knew somebody from Smithfield was working down there, and I went into the National Guard for two weeks right out of the uh, for summer camp. When I got back, he says, I got you a job. So I went and worked 13 months for Utah Concrete and Pipe there in Ogden. And uh, with this guy from Smithfield that he got me on. And then I quit that. I got a chance to go temporary for Utah Power and Light out of Smithfield. So I, always, while I was growing up and working in the service station, these guys at the power company come in and fill their trucks full of gas, you know. And I knew all the guys, and I was going to school with most of their kids. So I got a, a temporary job that ended up where I got on steady, and I ended up spending 42 years working for the power company. I started out as a groundman, and then I went to a tree trimmer, and uh, then I think I went back. I was going back and forth. And, and I'd get a raise every time, you know, to go to the next year's scale. And then I got to be an apprentice there in Smithfield where I started out and <clears throat> worked there <clears throat> at Smithfield as an apprentice lineman and went to, to Pre Preston and got to be a journeyman lineman and then I ended up being a foreman 
there, but I spent 42 years. And I look out in this cold weather now and think, oh, how did I stand that, you know, but we, we survived. How old was you when you retired? I was... I retired in 1998. I'm thinking I was 61 or two. It took a little early retirement. They offered an early retirement. Let me tell you a story about this. When we were dating, I decided I was going to surprise him, so I went and got a hamburger and decided I'd take him up his lunch. So I drive up. He's working in Smithfield Canyon. No, I was in North Logan. Well, he's climbing. He's up this pole. So I just pull up and I watch from the car, and all of a sudden, I hadn't seen him strap on. The little board comes out from under him, and he's just dangling. I, my heart just went, oh. <laughs> I didn't see him build on. Luckily, he built it on. There he was dangling. <laughs> well, she lost one husband. She didn't know if that was a good idea to marry me. And you had Blake with you then, too. Yeah, Blake was with me. So what happened? Were you well, able to rebalance yourself? Yeah. Yeah, we have what they call the baker board, so you, you mount it on the pole, and then you can stand out and put, build up over the wires and reach out. We had to go out past a lot of insulators to dead end the wire, and that board wasn't tightened, and I put some pressure sideways, and it slipped her way. It dried out from under him. Another night, he got a call in the middle of the night. He was on call, and so I wake. Blake out and pile him in the car. We decide to in the truck. We're going to go with him on this little call. And here we come in about 6 30 in the morning. We're out all night long. It's a good thing he had us, though. We were his radio man. Yeah, she, she was <laughs> talking to another guy we was working with, trying to find the trouble. And so she she was the radio man that night. <laughs> now, in 42 years, what were some of the most interesting things happen at work? for you top iron light <clears throat> well two of the things that i <laughs> tickled to death i'm alive I, I was actually hit twice with lightning i was working up in the indian reservation by chesterfield and we had the power out of the line and then we put a grounds on it you know to make sure it's dead but i was the lightning was a flashing and we was just going from structure to structure and uh, I was up the pole and, and I told the boss you need to get me down out of here I'm going to get killed and all at once I was reaching out I had to reach quite far and on one hook in the pole and, and I got hit the lightning come down the, the wire and into me and I just let out a scream and swung back into the pole my legs was like wet noodles and so I put my one arm around the pole and I have, we have a hand line and I wrapped one hand arm around the line and lowered me down I think it was probably 60, 65 foot pole laid on the ground for a while finally the boss says that's enough for one day and I was up on the Indian reservation with me and Louis Mendoza was, was just finishing the job and we was picking up a bunch of the wire rails and loading it on a uh, trailer Louie is up in the back of the truck. We put stuff up there too, and I I got hit and the lightning. And Louie says I was just a big ball of fire, and I fell to the ground and then started kicking and screaming. He says I looked like an uh, chicken with its head cut off. Do you, do you remember that at all? Oh yeah, I, I <laughs> there was a couple other times I had some real close calls on the ground. I had a past me and I just dropped to the ground and now that's not fun to be around that lightning uh, especially height you know like up on the poles and that and so and anyway that, you, I, you had to go help one time with a dam breaking right yeah up to uh, Rexburg that uh, he's building a new government dam up in Sugar City and they've just started to put water it was in July June and uh, it wasn't holding water. They could see it leaking out the dam, the face of the dam. And so they uh, tried to get cats in there and fill the dirt back in and then that blew out. And I was just lucky they only had that maybe a third or a half filled up. 
and that went down through and washed houses right down the river and flooded the yeah sugar city there wasn't much left of that so we were called to go up and help we went up on it happened on a saturday and we went up saturday sunday early morning we told us to pack this and this and this and we went up there to help get it back together but it washed out power lines a mile you'd find one that was up there a mile clear down to the next one a mile down and and we got that most people back even though it might have been temporary in about two weeks we had crews from all over utah power line all through down through we were from idaho and and went up and they had them down Ogden Salt Lake and it was the thing that impressed me there wasn't anybody I talked to was cursing the Lord and one I remember saying well it treated us all the same and people just totally lost their houses and just tore them but apart. But people came together to help each other. Oh they started for the church put people together for we left in that two weeks they was bringing bus loads of LDS people in from all over to help them clean up and that. Yeah, it was I've had some quiet experiences. Stay on track here. Um, any other experiences that you guys have had? Well I don't know. <laughs> we lost you. Yeah. Art Art Kelly. That was an experience. He, him and his buddy down the street disappeared. You and Barry decided you were going to go for a little ride on your three wheelers, and we or big we, wheels, big, your little three, big, big, your little three big, wheelers, big, big, your little big, ones, big, big wheels, your little three wheelers, and, and we up. found you clear down on about Fourth West. We had the cops out looking for you. Yeah, it was. And then Christy. Uh, we was at church one day, and we loaded all you kids in the car, and it had been quite a long day, and, and we come home, and I'm starting to get dinner, and I turn around and look, and it's been about a half hour that we've been home, and I look around and said, where's Christy? We'd left her at the church. Somebody <laughs> had her there waiting for us to come back and get her. The Branchleys had her. <laughs> we got a call on the phone, did you leave a daughter at the church? We'd even... <laughs> We'd even stopped at the store to buy one little thing over at the Maverick and come home and half hour out we get a phone call and did you leave a child at the church? It was Christy. Yeah. Um, did you now do you guys have any faith giving experiences in your youth? Uh, I don't really remember that having that happen to me. I always went to church. I remember that. Mother, she was a primary teacher for... How, how did you gain your testimony? Through time. Just getting older and older. And seeing and believing. And knowing that there was a, a God. And that we had prophets. So when I was uh, young, we only had... That when I started to remember how many members of the church, a million and a half back when I was a teenager. And it's just kept growing and growing. I think something that's very, very important is, is, is to do what your parents, to kind of follow what your parents have done, and hopefully your parents are good parents. Because we had, I had real good parents. My dad didn't per se go to church all the time, but I watched him. He was so caring with people. And, and that's a testimony builder is that, that you love everyone. Mother always took us to church, and I made sure I went and participated. That's the big thing. You made sure you gave talks. And you might be asked to do some hard things in the church, but, but maybe when you have to stretch out, you grow. Any tithing experiences you guys had? Yeah, I didn't, when I was married to Carlene, I paid very little, I did pay some, and uh, then I got the divorce and I started to pay him the tithing, and then Pat and I, mother and I started dating and planning on getting married, and she 
She says, one thing you will pay a full tithing. Before I marry you. And I, I was pretty well doing it, not just starting out it, because we did, when I was first married, I paid some, but not. So it's been a full tithing all the 47 years we've been married. Well, I'm a firm believer that if you pay your tithing, you never have to want. You might not be rich, but you won't be, you're spiritually rich. It, have you had any miracles? A that? miracle was with Blake when he was born. We was on our way to come to Logan, and I had six more weeks before I was going to have him, and I was coming for my shower, and we got about a half hour starting towards Logan. We was coming from Lehigh, and we had to turn around and go back because I had Blake six weeks early. And so uh, they kept Blake in the hospital, and they told us, you better come and give him a blessing. He was only three pounds, 12 ounces. He's not going to make it. He looked pretty bad. And so we, we had a lot of prayers. And, and they said to us, he was in the hospital a whole month before he was able to come home. And they told us the day before he was supposed to come home, now you have to pay the whole bill or you can't take him out of the hospital. Well, we kind of just gasped. We were just a young couple. That was our first baby. We, w we didn't have that kind of money. It was thousands and thousands of dollars. But something came up. Grandpa Skinner gave us the money, and I know that we were blessed because we had paid our tithing. The Lord finds a way for you to work things out, and he, he blesses you when you pay your tithing. Firm believer of tithing. We've never had to ever want in our lives. What's your greatest spiritual experience? I think probably on our mission. That's what I was going to say. I think uh, going there and telling the stories of those missionaries. Where, where, did, those you, where did you guys go on your mission for the camera? We went to Martin's Cove. First one was the six, six crossing the Willies. That was... That was upriver from us of uh, about 60 miles. And then, so we went there the first year, and then we went to Morton's Cove the second time. But to be able to tell those stories, and I've always said, <clears throat> I hope someday I get to meet those people. Because what they went through, there shouldn't have been many of them that made it. There had to be miracle after miracle up there and to hear the stories when they <clears throat> about bringing some youth in there that was not too good a youth but it was kind of renegades and then hearing people that's come back with, with the other groups tell us the stories about them did you, did you guys have any personal with people there any experiences with them right there? I think the thing that was a great thing for me was to see miracles right before your eyes, to see the kids' hearts be touched. Do you have touched. maybe one experience that you can share for the camera? I just remember going to a fireside. It was not a fireside, but it was around a campfire up there at Martin's that's a, Cove. That's a fireside. And and they they were having they were having a spiritual kind of like fireside around the fire. And the kids were so noisy. They were teenage kids, were so noisy. And I don't know, the spirit just came into that meeting and they quieted down and their hearts were just poured out through testimony. And I, I, you could just feel that spirit. And I'm sure that everyone that was there that night, their hearts were touched. And our whole mission was that way. You had a miracle too. When they didn't show up the, on the women's pole. Oh, we 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 do it on the telephone where we kind of step the groups through, and I pretty much took this over where we'd call back and forth for two the, months the, the groups, to try and set things up yeah. and make sure that everything would go just right for them. And when they get there, we still go over everything to make sure it's all lined up. Do you have your speaker for the woman's poll? Do you have this? Do you have this? Do you have this? And he was my first group. 
and we had just come from working in the visitor center, and and I had forgot to ask him, do you have your women's poll talks? Do you have your men and your women's? And so we raced right up there where they were getting ready to go up on the hill and pull the wagons. And hand carts. The hand carts. And he said no. He said the man that was over this felt very strongly he didn't want to have a talk. And and certain missionaries gave these kind of talks to the to the groups that came through, but we had not done that. And uh, I said, I remember his name was Brother Aristica. He was a uh, from Mexico. And I said, you'll have missed the whole point. You need to talk about the pioneers. You need to talk about why you're doing what you're doing. With the women, Paul. With the women. I said, if you don't have a speaker, would you allow me to go in there? And then all of a sudden, as he walked away, I realized what I had done. <laughs> I didn't have a talk ready. I, I had never done it before. But it worked beautiful. I went up in and we worked as a group together. We asked questions. We talked about it. And it was a very spiritual thing for me. And I'm sure for them it was better than not having a speaker. Now, when you guys first was going on your mission, Dad, you were gung-ho, and Mom, you were a little reserved for you and the family I and everything. I didn't want to leave the family. That changed towards the end. Oh, I loved it. <laughs> she, and I thought we went back the second year. When we went on our first mission, it's it's very, very hard. They're not easy. But what was really hard is that that you had a dialogue you had to learn. And we it had been a lot of years since we'd memorized or even had to really learn things verbatim. We had to know where the certain areas were and the mileage. And that was really tough for me, and I couldn't get it. I just couldn't get it. And I remember getting down on my hands and knees and just praying for help because I just couldn't get it. I, and I said to the Lord, if you'll help me be able to give this dialogue. And it was after I had just laid it out on the table and told him I would work my hardest to try and learn what I had to learn, that it, it came to me. The Lord helped me. And the way I could tell is I was in the visitor center trying to give this dialogue, and I knew when I had it right, I got so that I was able to tell it from my heart. And I could see it touch the people. I knew that they were <coughs> hearing and feeling the spirit that the Lord wanted them to feel. We was in the visitor center one Sunday, and so we wasn't able to go to church. And we just sitting there, things was pretty quiet. And uh, your mother was sound asleep there, and, and I was half asleep, and I heard these motorcycles pull in. And I got up and looked out the window, and she said, Who's that? I says, It's Hell's Angels. <laughs> Boy, did she panic. They, oh. were, they were in black coats with helmets. But it was two guys and their wives riding with them. LDS, been to... A, what a church along the way somewhere to come in to talk to Well, him. I said oh. to him, what are you going to do? And what did you say? <laughs> I'm going to go out and talk oh, to him, yeah. of course. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I could see you. Yeah, it wasn't Hell's Angels, but they come in on some nice parties, you know, the two of them. And, boy, that got her to attention in <laughs> hurry. Dad, now when you were there uh, introducing yourself, there was a story that came out of that. You want to explain that? You, everybody was introducing who they were, what they did as a job. <laughs> well, there was a lot of high-powered people there. That <laughs> a lot of them was professors and engineers. And they wanted us to tell about us. And, and we was right out on the end. And we're going on as if uh, we was in the barn ones. there and sitting around tables and and it got to me and I'd had it. And I thought, <laughs> Here I am. I just barely got through high school. And I, I got up and I says, "I am a little Hindu. I do what I can do, but if by chance I lose my pants, I let my little skin do." And then he sit down. <laughs> I felt better after that. 
What I really learned was joking. <laughs> Um, any relationships that you still that went bad through your life that you still wish you would have had today? That I had bad? Yeah, some relationships go bad through time with certain people or individuals. Have you ever had one that went bad that you really wish that you could mend? Well, I went through that divorce, and I did everything in my power to try to get it to work, and I'm. I'm glad I got your mother. I had a guy I worked with, Leroy Johnson, says, just hang in there. He says, you're going to end up to be a lot better off than you was married to her, and it happened. That was a prophecy that came true, huh? Yeah, yeah, an old Leroy. I think my biggest regret, and it's okay now, but we kind of had really estranged feelings between Eddie's children right at first when we was married and, and Brett never did accept us and we've never been How old was Brett at that time? Oh, he, he was probably about He 13. was 16 when he died and we've been married. I don't know, it could have been. He was about 13 but I I don't know that he ever really accepted me but with Shelly I, I, I loved her right from the start but I never did feel like we had a very close relationship until the last year, and I have just learned to love her. She's a beautiful girl, and I hope someday we can get her to do the things she needs to do so she'll be in heaven with us. Take a pause right there.